Hey YouTube, how you doing? Thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew with the Counselor's Guild. And today we'll be doing a book review on The Gift of Therapy by the legendary Irvin Yalom. Um, if you, well we'll start off, let's look at Irvin um, Yalom. If that name sounds familiar, it's because you probably had to read his textbook in grad school, The Theory and Practice of Group Psychotherapy. Um, he also written about 16 other books, uh, one being The Gift of Therapy, but he's written a lot of others. I think I'm going to check out his existential psychotherapy textbook um, soon. It's 60 bucks. If I bought that book, it'd be the most expensive book I ever bought, excluding textbooks, but I don't count them. Um, those are books that I had to buy. But anyway, um, so he's read a lot of books, and he's almost, he's the, and I said this in, in the comments, he's the leader of research in group psychotherapy. I believe he still has and runs the lab, the research lab on group psychotherapy at Stanford. Um, so you will read his book, and you will know who Irvin Yalom is if you go to grad school. Um, he is an American psychiatrist. He holds an MD. Um, let's see, what else? He's, he's an existential... Uh, interpersonal psychologist I don't think he does from his book he seems to do more like psychotherapy than just prescribing medication but as a psychiatrist he can do both uh, he's written most uh, multiple books he's a professor at Stanford University um, and that's Irvin Yala okay now the book the book is 259 pages it's not very long 85 chapters there's a postscript and it's written for therapists the 85 chapters are 85 bits of advice that he's given to the new generation of therapists. So this book is written for, I would say, almost out of grad school, um, young therapists, and even therapists that are in the game still. You know, I, I, I think it could be helpful uh, to read through this and, and kind of see what Irvin has learned, Dr. Yalom has learned through his years of practice. I think it could be beneficial. So, let's see. Let's let's see. Existential therapy. Okay, so I I wanted to go over existential psychotherapy, and did I miss? I feel like I missed a slide. No. Okay. So existential psychotherapy. He wrote at the beginning of his chapter, chapter one, I believe. He says, "I work from an interpersonal and existential frame of reference. Hence, the bulk of the advice that follows issues from one." or the other of these two perspectives. Um, so the 85 chapters, the advice he gives you is framed from existential and uh, interpersonal uh, theory. So let's first look at um, existential. I pulled up the Wikipedia, I don't know how you feel about Wikipedia, but it's easy and fast, so what the heck. Uh, Wikipedia says existential therapy. It's the form of psychotherapy based on the model of human nature and experience developed by the existential tradition of European philosophy. Very heavy into philosophy. Uh, focuses on concepts that are universally applicable to human existence, including death, freedom, responsibility, and the meaning of life. Instead of regarding human experiences such as anxiety, alienation, and depression as implying the presence of mental illness, existential psychotherapy sees these experiences as natural stages in a normal process of human development and maturation. In facilitating the process of development and maturation, existential psychotherapy involves a philosophical exploration of the individual's experiences, stressing the individual's freedom and responsibility to facilitate a higher degree of meaning and well-being in their life. Okay, and as you can look at the content over here, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but look at all these there. I mean, look at all these philosophers. You know, Kier Kierkegaard, Nietzsche. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. Heidegger. Um, so very, a very humanist perspective. Um, so that's going to affect how he views, um, psych, you know, a person's psychological makeup. You know, their issues, and how he thinks best to help that person. Um, if you look at the bottom sentence, it's it's exploration of an individual's experiences, stressing the individual's freedom and responsibility to facilitate a larger degree of meaning and well-being in their life. 
So <clears throat> does that is that what the therapist kind of facilitates with the client who's going through an existential, I don't want to say crisis because that's kind of cliche, but that's kind of what it is. Um, Y'all have called it a conflict, existential conflict. You know, are we, you know, helping them, you know, facilitate a higher degree of meaning and well-being in their life in order to get through that conflict? But anyway, that's a little bit on existential therapy. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read all this, but it is very, um, very heavy in philosophy. I say more than any other one. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can check that out. Again, I know Wikipedia is iffy, but it's just easy and fast and um, makes life easier. All right, so back to existential. Uh, Yalom said um, in his book, I'm at the second point here, um, he's never considered existential approach a freestanding school. Okay, It, it needs to be uh, coupled with another orientation and his is interpersonal um, and he says that uh, you know existential psychotherapy is organized around four ultimate concerns of life death freedom isolation and meaning of life there's a conflict that arises from our confrontation with each one of these so you may not think about death young you know but as you get older and more family members begin to die, or if you're a soldier and you've seen a lot of death, there's a conflict that arises. And um, through existential psycho, you know, psychotherapy, and from what the Wikipedia page says, um, that the symptoms revolving around you know your anxiety and depression around death, well, that's normal. You know, um, it's a normal process of human development and maturation. What the therapist is going to do is help that patient. Um, and I, I think, I'm not an existential therapist, by the way. Um, but I, I, am, I want to learn more. I do like, I do like it. Um, and I, I work with a lot of seniors, so I think this could be very helpful. Um, but if you read that last sentence, it seems like that's what the therapist is trying to help the patient do. Um, they have this conflict. Um, and psychotherapy involves a philosophical philosophical or exploration of an individual's experience stressing the individual's freedom and responsibility to facilitate higher degree of meaning and well-being in life so it's helping that client get through that conflict looking at the meaning behind it um, you know um, well-being in their life I mean I know I'm not an expert on existential uh, psychotherapy by any means um, but, but it's really interesting. I, I think it's really interesting. And, and you can tell, you, everybody knows we go through these conflicts. You know, we don't, when you were young, we don't really think about it. But, you know, if you ever remember or if you think about when your family member died, you tend to think about, oh, what am I going to, you know, what's going to happen to my family when I die? Or am I living my best life? Or, you know, what's the meaning of all this? Why am I here? What's the purpose? You know, all those types of conflicts come up. And it can make you really feel depressed if you if you let it. Um, so I think that's where existential psychotherapy, you know, comes in and helps you find that meaning and that purpose, and it gets you through that conflict. Now, I think I feel I feel like I'm talking in circles now, so I'll move on. Uh, but sometimes it helps organizing my thoughts to do that. Uh, increased sensibility. So what he wanted is the increased sensibility of future therapists to the existential themes. That was one purpose of his book. He said that, I think, either beginning of it or he has there's a postscript that's full of good information. So if you get the book, make sure you read the postscript. So interpersonal psychotherapy. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. Interpersonal psychotherapy is a brief attachment-focused psychotherapy that centers on resolving interpersonal problems and symptomatic recovery. It is empirically supported treatment that follows a highly structured, well, I like highly structured, and time-limited approach that is intended to be completed within 12 to 16 weeks. Now, it's funny because Dr. Yellen was kind of like dissing the, uh, the whole managed care at, 
in one of his chapters. He comes back in, in the postscript and kind of says, yeah, he was kind of a little too harsh on the managed care and and uh, the time, um, uh, the, the brief therapies and the, the time-limited stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, interpersonal therapy, 12 to 16 weeks, so four months. IPT is based on the principle that relationships and life events impact mood and that the reverse is also true. And mood affects life events and relationships. It was developed by Gerard Clerman and Myrna, Minor, I don't know, Myrna, uh, for major depression in the 70s. This has been adopted uh, for other mental disorders. IPT is an empirically validated intervention for depressive disorders and more effective when used in combination with psycho psychiatric medications, along with CBT. IBT is recommended in treatment guidelines as psychosocial treatment. Um, anyway, let's, let's move down here. Um, so what it's all about here. So interpersonal theory right here describes a way, describe the ways in which patients' maladaptive metacommunication patterns lead to or evoke difficulty in their here and now interpersonal relationships. And you'll see some of his chapters. Um, he's a very here and now therapist. I think he had like five chapters on the here and now, <laughs> staying present. Because as a therapist, what he's saying is, well, how that client or patient interacts with you, that's how they interact with everybody. So you need, as a therapist, you need to figure out what is it about their interpersonal skills that is making them some, so unlikable or causing all these confrontations and arguments. Um, let's see here. The aim of IPT is to help the patient to improve interpersonal and inter intrapersonal communication skills within relationships and to develop social support network with realistic expectations to develop with a crisis precipitated in distress and to weather interpersonal storms. So interpersonal skills is how you relate to others. Um, I know I used to do a lot of interpersonal skills training uh, when I worked in patient psych, um, people with severe mental illness like schizophrenia. Um, that caused, uh, schizophrenia caused a host of interpersonal problems. Um, and it was a, it was a big uphill battle. But anyway, um, clinical application, I won't get into all that. Um, so attachment focused psychotherapy at centers on resolving interpersonal problems and symptomatic recovery, okay? So let's go back to that. So that's that's Yalom's approach is going to be existential, getting through those you know confronting those conflicts, and interpersonal skills, you know. Um, and through the book, I mean, he, he, all the advice he gives you, you can tell um, that you know where he's coming from. And we'll get into a lot, a couple of the chapters. I'm not going to give you every chapter because that would be. I don't know, copyright maybe, but I'll get in a couple of them. Advice for therapy from Yalom. Okay, so a couple of these chapters, and we can kind of look at them. Chapter one, remove the obstacles of growth. Uh, humans beings have an inbuilt propensity towards self-realization. If obstacles are removed, the individual will develop into a mature, fully realized adult. My, Yalom, not me, task was to identify and remove them. So you see the advice he kind of gives out. Um, you know, and the obstacles could be the confrontations of one of those those life events, um, or the obstacle could be, you know, how to, how the person's relating to another person. Um, so it's kind of chapter one. I think that's a pretty universal um, that could be applied to all types of therapy. So it could be applied to all therapists. We're all trying to help clients and patients move forward. And there's always some type of barrier or obstacle in the way. If there wasn't, they would be able to do it themselves. Chapter 14 through 23. Okay, and I said the here and now. He goes over this a lot. The here and now is all dedicated um, in chapter 14 through 23. Refers to the immediate events of the therapeutic hour. Well, the here and now is very present. <laughs> Up to the hour. You know, it's not an hour before or an hour, you know, you know, 
in the morning or whatever. It's this therapy hour. That's that's what we're focused on. Um, to what is happening here in this office, in this relationship, and in the in betweenness. So if this person has interpersonal skill problems, are they going to develop a healthy relationship with a therapist? You know, therapist is going to know. Um, interpersonal therapist is going to know. So the relationship is really important for an interpersonal therapist. Well, relationship is important for everybody, but um, I think to an interpersonal therapist, it means more because they can see where the issues lie. Um, okay, so the in-between is the space between me and you. And now, in the immediate hour, the rationale for using the here and now rests upon a couple of basic assumptions. One, the importance of interpersonal relationships and to the idea of therapy as a social microcosm so this is all yalom this is kind of what he says uh well, this is what he says uh, i'm quoting him here um in in that chapter i think it's chapter 14 i got this from um by and large people fall into despair because of their inability to form and maintain enduring and gratifying interpersonal relationships psychotherapy based on the interpersonal model is directed towards removing the obstacles to satisfying relationships. Okay, so kind of one, going back to one, removing the obstacle. Uh, so the here and now, very important for Yalom and for um, interpersonal th psychotherapy. Um, let's see, it's not really focused on the past or the future. Well, I don't know who's really focused on the future. Uh, maybe if you're doing like some... Um, uh, got solution focus sometimes that goes in the future right you know what are we going to do this week differently or I don't know a lot of it's in the past right some of the psychoanalytic or psychodynamics kind of digging up the past and seeing where you know these obstacles came from they became aware of these obstacles and where they came from and they can get over them um, but this is more here and now it's all about the relationship um well, that was a couple other chapters, a couple more. Um, chapter 37 is one I really liked, Feedback and Psychotherapy. Um, I, I'd never seen this before, that's why I wanted to put it up here. It says here, Quadrant 1, known to myself and to others. This is your public self. Okay, I know me, I know it, they know it, public. Quadrant 2, unknown to self, but known to others, blind self. Quadrant three, known to self and unknown to others, the secret self. And the last one, quadrant four, unknown to self and others is the unconscious self. Now, Yalom says, in therapy, we attempt to change the size of the four cells. We try to help the public cell, which is number one. Okay. We try to get the quadrant one, the public cell, to grow larger so that they are aware of it. And the public's aware of it, right? Known to self and others. At the expense of the other three. And the secret self to shrink as patients through the process of self-disclosure. So very similar to, you know, any, any other therapist, you know, trying to make the unconscious conscious. Um, and through learning that, um, you can identify the barriers and things that are in your way and make progress. In the cell two, the blind self that we particularly target both in individual and group therapy. So quadrant two is unknown to self and known to others. Um, and in group, I think he talked about his group psychotherapy uh, a couple times in his book. He doesn't talk a lot about it, um, but he does say in group therapy that can be helpful because a lot of group members are getting feedback from other members saying, hey, you know, the way you talk, you know, I can see why somebody might not, might, might take that the wrong way. Or, if, you know, you treated this person really badly in the relationship, and no wonder they, you know, so it's like people around them are getting it, but they just don't see it. Uh, so cell two, the blind self, is, is uh, tar particularly targeted in group and individual. Um, it is through feedback, therapists and group members, uh, the patient becomes better witnesses to their own behavior and learn to appreciate the impact of their behavior upon the feelings of others. So I kind of just said that. That's what Yalom said in his, in his book. Um, so that's how you make that private, or not the private, the um, um, unknown self more public. 
because a lot of people they they walk around and they don't see that they're they're the common denominator to 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 their problems. So that was a good chapter. I liked that. I never seen the quadrant, so I thought that was that was good. Chapter forty six also. Uh, I, I like these chapters. I think they're pretty universal. Helping patients assume responsibility. Um, if and this was part of the existential psychotherapy definition we looked at. Um, if we hope to make, and this is y'all, I'm saying this, if we hope to, for more significant therapeutic change, we must encourage our patients to assume responsibility. That is, to apprehend how they themselves contribute to the distress. And personally, you are the common denominator. The world's not going to change around you. you got to change around it. Okay? You can't just be going around talking to people any, any way you want. You gotta take responsibility. You know these problems aren't gonna go away, and there's nobody here that's going to save you. Um, but I like that one. I like assuming responsibility. Really important. Even if 99%, uh, Yom says this. I'm quoting him. Even if 99% of the bad things that happen to you are someone else's fault, I want to look at the other 1%, the part that is your responsibility. We have to look at your role, even if it's very limited. Because that's where I can be most help. So that's a good, I mean, that's a good hint, or not hint, a tip for psychotherapists. What does this person have control over? They don't have any control over how their parents are treating them. Or the government system, you know, they don't have any control over a lot of things. You have to stay focused on what can I help this person with? You know, what? What can I help them change? Because you gotta find out what's respond, what they're responsible for, um, and focus on on that. You know, there's a million other things that the, the, your client, your patient, just don't have any control over. Uh, let's see, where was I? Have, oh, third point: responsibility uh, assumption can be so difficult that it constitutes the major part of therapy. And once the step is taken, therapeutic change may occur almost automatically and effortlessly. Responsible assumption can be so difficult that it constitutes a major part of therapy. A lot of people don't want to take responsibility, right? Nobody wants to be accountable. They, you know, they all want to point the finger or pass it to the next person, or you know, your life is your life, and you're responsible for it. You know how it, how it comes out. You know, at a certain age, you just can't be blaming mom and dad. Um, and I don't say that to be, you know, disingenuous. But I say it more, if you don't start thinking that way, you're never going to move on from it. So, I think that's kind of what Yellen was getting at, too, is, you know, once you assume responsibility, identify the barriers, and it's your responsibility to get over them. You know, you're, you're, on the, you're on the way to getting over them. I mean, it's, it, it is really hard to accept, though. Uh, every therapist develops methods to facilitate responsibility assumption. Um, let's see here. Uh, last point. Yalom says responsibility assumption is an essential first step in the therapeutic process. Once individuals recognize their role in creating their own life predicament, they also realize that they, and only they, have the power to change the situation. And that's similar to like the stage of change therapy where you have the preoccupation and the you know, pre, man, pre, what's the word? Not preoccupation. I don't know if it begins with a C. Contemplation, there it is. Pre-contemplation, right? That's where they don't, they don't see anything as a problem and they don't want to change and then contemplation where they kind of think they have a problem or yeah I got a problem but I'm still kind of you know on the fence and whether or not I want to do it but it's kind of similar to that but I like I like 46 I think that's important to know the young therapist if the patients are never taking responsibility and and wanting to change you can't force them to change yeah keep hunting hunting for ways on how they can assume responsibility and start uh, making those changes on their own and trying to help them to, to find the best possible way to to do that. So, uh, next up. 49. 
I like 49. 49 was focused on resistance to decisions. Yom says, decision is another boundary experience. It not only confronts us with the degree to which we create ourselves, but also to the limits of possibilities. Making a decision cuts us off from other possibilities. But, oh man, you know what? That there was important for something, and now I don't remember why. Uh, uh, I think, is it because when you make a decision, you're responsible? or mm, The more we face our limits, the more we have to reflect when we relinquish our myth of personal specialness. Unlimited potential, imperishability, and, and immunity to the laws of biological destiny. Okay, that's a lot of the existential in there. We're not special. We're not going to live forever. We're not immune to disease or, you know, death. It's, it's closer than you think. You know, you could die any day, any minute, right? Um, no matter how, how old you are. Um, some people have a hard time accepting that, I think, and facing that. The path to decision may be a hard because it leads to the territory of both finiteness and groundlessness, domain soaked in anxiety. I don't know why I put that there, but I like that chapter for, I think I'm missing a bulk of what he talked about in 49, and I don't remember what it was. Darn. I wrote this up like a week ago, and then winter storm hit, and I'm kind of like forgetting a lot of it. But anyway, 49, check that out. That was, that was one I liked, even though I can't tell you why. Um, I did like that one. Chapter 70, A History of Patients' Daily Schedule. Uh, I, I like this. I mean, as as a therapist, I, I, I kind of like knowing what's going on. Yom just says that he does this with every patient. Um, he said, there's one particular productive inquiry I always make in the first or second session. Please give me a detailed account of your typical day. I make sure everything is discussed, including eating and sleeping habits, dreaming, recreation, periods of discomfort, enjoy precise tasks at work, the use of alcohol, drugs. And most of us will do this on like a psychosocial assessment or whatever assessment our company gives us that we have to do, you know, first time we see them. Um, if you have your own private practice, you probably have some type of assessment you use to get a good background on what um, your client is going through or what they're presenting with. <sighs> If this inquiry is sufficiently detailed, therapists can learn a great deal, uncovering information that is often missed in the other history-making systems. Um, most assessments, initial assessments, don't include the question or the um, uh, command of, I want to know, well, I don't want to be demanding, <laughs> the command, please give me the detailed account of your typical day. Um, I've never seen one with that, but I, I like that. I think that's good. Um, I think that could be very useful. Uh, last point, an inquiry into the minute de minute, I'm pretty sure it's minute, minute details of the per patient's life can only lead, not only leads to rich material otherwise often missed, but also gives a jump start to the bonding process. Yeah. All right, so those are some chapters that I like. I think I put... Some chapters I didn't like. And I'm not trying to say, like, hey, I know more than y'all. I mean, that's just crazy. Um, but these are just things that I, I really I have a tough time saying, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You know? Um, so tell me what you think. If, if, if this, if you're kind of iffy on, this, on, on these, these tips, too. If you read the gift of therapy, is there ones that you didn't like? What, which ones did you like the most? You know, let me know in the comments. Uh, chapter 10, create a new therapy for each patient. Now, I, I'm all for no cookie cutter treatment plans, and every patient's different. Like, I, I know that, okay? But if a person presents with anxiety, I mean, you can, you, there's some similar, I don't want to say like steps. Like, the steps you take in order to help that person with their anxiety, like, their anxiety could be different. It could be a different severity. Um, it could be, you know, from a different, you know, trigger, whatever. That can be all different, and the treatment plan has to cater to those differences.
but the steps, like he was all, he was like, there shouldn't be steps, you know, I got like workbooks that are just so structured and full of steps that, you know, I was like, I kind of like that, you know, because I know we're in progressing. Um, I like to see where, where we're at, you know, but I think for Jan, he didn't like that. He, he didn't, he didn't like having these steps and I don't know, he just, so I'm kind of like, I, I see his point of view of creating new therapy for each patient and every, every time they come in, um, that you're not working on a certain step or worksheet or anything like that. Um, so I was kind of iffy on that one. Like I get it. But I know what works for me and what I like, and I like having something to look at and to kind of see where this person's at, you know, in their therapy. Chapter 35, I'm being helped by your patient. Um, I don't think I pay my patient. Um, I feel like it'd be uneth unethical to... to benefit from my patient you know and it was chapter 35 I feel like it was kind of like maybe I was overthinking it or, or whatever but I just don't think a, a therapist should be benefiting from a patient um, he says here I believe it is commonplace for therapists to be helped by their patient Jung often spoke to the increased efficiency of the wounded healer. He even claimed that therapy worked best when the impatient brought the perfect salve for the therapist's wounds. I think that's just a little unethical. I just don't, I don't think. And that if the therapist doesn't change, then the patient doesn't either. Perhaps wounded healers are affected because they are more able to empathize with the wounds of the patient. Perhaps it's because they participate because they participate more deeply and personally in the healing process. So, um, no. If you're a therapist and you got issues of your own, you need to work out in therapy with a therapist. Uh, I don't think we should. I don't know. Well, you, let me know what you think. I'm kind of, I'm like, I don't think it's, it's ethical, but also I can see also therapists benefiting from helping um, people. I don't know. Let me know what you think. Do home visits was chapter 58. I'm not doing any home visits. <laughs> I've done enough home visits, and I've seen enough crap and nasty stuff. I ain't doing home visits. Um, no, I think I think I just, I, I function, and, and I, I think I do better in an office setting. Um, I'm not against home visits. I just, I feel like, I don't know, I just feel like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do those. So that's my opinion. Uh, number number chapter sixty three. Don't be afraid of touching your patients. This is kind of this is kind of tough for a man, and he's a man, right? Especially nowadays, it's like, you know, how are they going to interpret that? And, and he says in the book, you got to have a, that type of relationship where they know. Uh, but he says it's important to to you know to touch, comfort your patient. I just I'm not. I guess I have my own issues with that uh, personally. I just. I just uh, don't feel right touching people. And, uh, you know, the same thing, you know, goes, especially for patients, just a different la relationship. And, and, like, hugs, like, I'll, I'll handshake. You know, handshakes are good. Um, but, like, hugs and, and uh, putting your arm around them and comforting. Like, I get that. Like, I, I understand the, the benefit of doing that. I just, I don't know, it's hard for me to do that. It, it's my own weakness. All right, so those are some chapters that I was like, oh, I don't really like, um, but again, I'm not at Yalom's level, <laughs> but I don't, there's no way uh, I would feel like confident in my, myself to say that, hey, I have better point of views or anything like that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, uh, but it's just my kind of ideas. All right, next up, dream work. Man, this guy has a lot of chapters devoted to dream work. And I'm kind of on the fence on dream work. I'm not a big believer in it. He has, what, six chapters on dreams? Um, chapter 80 is called Master Some Dream Navigational Skills. And, I mean, I've done this for a long time. I haven't mastered any of them. Um, some, some people bring them up. I don't pay much mind to them. Um, I never feel like... 
I needed to to be successful. Um, thought I'm not a big user of dreams, nor do I care about uh, dreams. But yeah, man, he's got six chapters devoted to it. So uh, I don't know. Maybe I should should look into it. He says here first, make it clear that you're interested in them. I make a point of inquiring about dreams in the first session. He says, I particularly inquire about repetitive dreams. Now, those repetitive dreams are a little bit different. I do know that those are usually important, um, and there's usually a message or a recurring theme around them. Uh, it usually means there's something going on, you know, uh, some kind of stressor or something. Uh, so repetitive dreams I've heard, I remember hearing, are important. Um, so repetitive dreams, nightmares, uh, or other powerful dreams. Usually, my first question is about the dream effect. Uh, what are you feeling you experience in various parts of the dream? What is your emotional center of the dream? Next, I urge patients to select parts of the dream and associate freely to the content. I mean, it's kind of like asking, like, what do you think they mean? Um, and, of course, I inquire about the relevant events of the day preceding the dream. The most I get to this is I'll ask patients, how's your sleeping? Are you having nightmares? Are there night terrors? You know, um, are you getting a full night's sleep? You know, are your, your problems there? I, like, I, I ask questions about their sleep, but I never ask about really dreams. And I, I don't know. I feel like I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't have a very favorable opinion about dreams. Uh, let me know what your opinion is of them. Uh, I never use them, and I don't really ask about them. So. Um, all right. But there is a lot of chapters on dream work. He, he, he's a big fan of, of analyzing dreams. Overall, overall, this is a perfect book for young therapists. Uh, any therapist who's interested in learning, practicing existential interpersonal psych psychotherapy. Uh, I am interested in existential psychotherapy. He got a book. Uh, he wrote the textbook on it. I think I'm going to get that next and read through it. Um, I'm working with a lot of seniors now, so I feel like all of those confrontations that he talks about could be pretty helpful um, for me. Um, not that I would use it because you probably have to be certified into um, that mode of therapy in order to even practice it. But uh, I don't know, maybe I'll check out if there's any CEUs or certificates that I can apply for. Um, I, I do think as as I get older too, it's you know the existential psychotherapy is very useful for me in understanding because I'm starting to go through a lot of this stuff. You know, as far as wow, I never really had a existential conflict, um, but I think my you know I think having you know like me, I have a Christian faith, so a lot of that purpose and meaning and. Um, you know, we're, 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 you know, being afraid of death, that's kind of all, that, that helps me deal with all those confrontations. Um, so I don't feel like I have a lot of anxiety or depression around that. Um, but anyway, um, I was the gift of therapy. I feel like I went on a little too long. Um, and sometimes I, I talk on things that... Probably no one cares about, but um, if you're interested, I'd get it. It's it's pretty cheap. I think I bought it for thirteen dollars on Amazon. Uh, it's it's pretty nice. It's it's really well written, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So I would check it out if you're interested in existential interpersonal therapy. Uh, if you want to know what the great Irvin Yalom, if he was to give you advice on on how to practice, you know, it's um, worth the read. So check it out. If you have any comments, if I'm if I explain something wrong or um, maybe I made a mistake, you know I, I'm willing to admit that. Leave me a uh, you know comment correcting me. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not a professional in existential psychotherapy or in interpersonal therapy. Um, it's not something I use often uh, or ever. Uh, so it was very nice learning a new. Uh, dynamic that's the right word yeah i think it's the right word orientation is what i call them so but anyway that's all i got uh like and subscribe you know give me a comment let me know how how you're doing i appreciate it y'all have a good night